I was just saying this is like the fourth or fifth closure talk that I've given, and this is the first time we're actually going to show some closure code, so I'm excited. <laughs> Which is why Nada is typing. <laughs> yeah. So okay. for this talk, we, we were inspired by David Nolan's presentation at Lambda Jam, where he uh, showed how much he was inspired by academic papers. And we thought it would be interesting to, for this audience to, to demystify how you read an academic paper and, and get something out of it. So the... <laughs> So you can, so there can be more David Nolan's around. I don't know. Okay. Just so saying. <laughs> okay, go. No, do you want to add something? What? Oh, no, no, no. Well, okay. I mean, it's hard even for academics to read this stuff, right? Yeah. So we, were, we, were, we picked a paper yesterday, which we're going to show you today, and when we first looked at the rules, we're like, oh, we can't show this because we don't understand any of it, right? So <laughs> that's what we're going to show you. But we're going to start from very basic things. So in, in papers, syntax are usually shown in this abstract way, where you just say, OK, a, a piano number is either the 0, the z, or a successor of another number. And it's a recursive definition. Yeah. So when you see a definition like this, you can think a couple different ways when you're going to implement this in Clojure. One, you could implement this using uh, like pattern matching with core match. But we're going to do uh, core logic for this for this particular example. And for all our, example, all our examples, we're going to use either core match or, okay. or core logic. They're both. Uh, so let's dive nice right shows. in. I'll try to put the, um, the slides here, anyways. So that <laughs> <laughs> OK, they're here. Patience. <laughs> OK. So um, who here is familiar with core logic? OK, so that's, that's good. That's a good show of hands. <laughs> So in, we're, we're going to define uh, a relation that just captures the constraint of what it is to be a, a piano number. So let's call it piano. And um, no piano O. Yeah. Okay. But so usually, <laughs> usually relations Do it right. O. But okay. Well. There you go. Okay. I'm just going to call it NATO then. I prefer. It. <laughs> so let's do that. Fine. So we have two cases here. So let's have a condi, one for each case. The first one is easy. We just say n is z. And the second one, we have to capture this other n, which is uh, smaller here. So I'm going to do fresh n minus 1 and unify this um, like this. And this works, but I also want to add the constraint that n minus 1 is itself uh, another piano number. Yeah. So and if you're not familiar with core logic, Condi just expresses a disjunction, and um, Fresh introduces a new variable, logic variable, and can sequence uh, other expressions. So now if I evaluate this run expression, I get, I get this as a result. And the list is not empty, so it means something was successful. And this underscore zero is an unbound logic variable, which is the, this Q here, which we haven't used in the, in, the, in the expression at all. So this just says that Z is a piano number. And we can also try a different one. And that also works. OK, how about something that's not a number? Um, so clearly, one is not a number. Clearly. <laughs> and we can also uh, generate numbers. So we can ask for the ten, ten, uh, 10 piano numbers, and it gives us a list here. OK. And we're not going to do a run star. No. <laughs> All right, so that was piano numbers. And now, now that we have this inductive definition for numbers, we can also write inductive definitions for relations on numbers. Yeah. So this notation is showing inference rules. We have two inference rules. And these will pop up over and over again. They come up in all sorts of computer science and programming language papers. 
Uh, the first inference rule, you can kind of imagine it having one of these horizontal lines, except there's nothing above it. So, and sometimes it's written that way. So the, w the way to read this horizontal line is what is below is the conclusion, and what is above is the pre premise or premises. There might be more. And another way to think of it is if you need to show, if you need to show uh, something that has this shape, you can, re you can reduce it to just showing something that has uh, this. In order to show this, it is sufficient to just show this. Okay, so for the top one, we're, we have a rule, which we're calling plus z, that's saying that zero plus any integer gives us back the original integer. And we don't have to prove anything else for that to hold. That just always holds. And for the second case, we're saying that the successor of some number, so one plus n one, plus n2 is the same as the successor of n3, provided that n1 plus, n1 plus n2 equals n3. So this is a, basically a recursive definition, and eventually, if we apply it enough times, we'll get that to the base case, which is plus c. So a very simple set of rules. And, and, there, yeah. Yeah. and there are two ways to look at this. The first is as a relation. So it's a three-place relation here, where this is the first, the first um, um, position, second position, and third position. Or in this case, it's also a function where you can think of it's a function of two arguments that returns the, the third. And in this case, we can treat it as a function because we have, um, if we look at the first argument, we do have a, an inductive uh, definition on the first argument. So we're going to first show you this using core match and write it as a function. It will take two numbers and then return a third number. That's too bad. Okay. Okay, so the, for the first, I think I'll just, we all remember the definition, right? I can just <laughs> go like this. Okay, so let's define plus as a, as a function using core match. So it takes n1 and n2, and we're just matching on the first. Yes. And if the first is z, then we just return um, n2, n2. And if the first is the sequence with an s and n minus 1, then what we do is that we say, OK, we are going to return a successor of plus n minus 1 and n2. Whoops. Um, yeah. OK, that's fine. So now we can try it out. And that's, yeah. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you try a harder one. <laughs> OK. Yay, we had it one and one. <laughs> Okay, so now we can do it in, in core logic. I <laughs> they'll clap for that. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> Wait till we add two and three. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I <laughs> No, no, don't do it now. Wait, wait until we do it in core logic. Hold on. Okay. So um, let's do a plus O this time. Yeah. And how many arguments does this take? Three. Okay. So three place relation. So again, a Condé. And um, so in the first case, we just say n1 is z, and then n2 is n3. That was the, the mm -hmm. axiom. And in the second case, um, we say, OK, we say n1 is a successor. And then we say, OK, the result is also going to be a successor. And then we need to do the recursive constraint. Okay. 
So that's that. And now we can call it on, let's just, should we call, let's just run it, because I don't want to type so much. <laughs> okay, so for a core logic program, if you don't feel like typing in any of the input, you just feed it fresh variables. And it yeah, but I, it I still. It tells you what it's supposed to do. Okay, well, we can, well, okay, let's do, let's just do, um, let's run it forward. Okay. Yeah, let's still do that. Let's run it forward. So we have that. And we can also run it backwards. Let's try this. We have that again. Okay. <laughs> oh. No, run it for real. Like, put in more variables. Okay, I'll put variables everywhere. Then. Yeah. Q, A, B, C. Plus O, A, B, C. Yeah, so I don't know if that's very interesting because it's just, <laughs> it's just showing the, it's really showing how this works. Well, it's about as interesting as piano gets, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so the point of this isn't that this is like high-powered programming. The point of this is that we are trying to come up with the simplest possible example of reading these inference rules, and, and this is about it. So uh, the, the point is, whenever you see rules like this that have a line, they're all of this form metaphorically, and you can use normally either something like core match or core logic to, to implement them. So you might see lots of other Greek letters here, and we're gonna get to some more complicated examples in a second, but the idea is still the same. So okay. it's really straightforward. So our, our second example is motivated because in functional programming related papers, it, it shows, us, shows up a lot. It's a lambda calculus. And so here's how you would have the syntax. You either have a variable, an abstraction, or an application. Yeah. And now we can jump straight to some inference rules for, for typing. So it's really, it's really the same process as the, the, the other one. So let's yes, look do at not be alarmed. We have our same friendly line, right? It means it's easy. <laughs> let's, let's look at, uh, at uh, application first. So if, you're, if you have E1 and E2 and you're applying, E1, is a, E1 has to be a function. And E2 has to have a type that matches the, the parameter type of the function. And then you can apply it, and you get this result type T. Yeah, so you just think of it, maybe E1 is, um, evaluates to a function that takes this add one, right? It takes, takes a number and adds one to it, right? So. Okay, so. Oh, come on, that makes it too easy. Okay, so, well, yeah, we'll explain these other symbols. So Fine. This? <laughs> these things, this is like a hangman thing. That's gamma. This is the type environment or typing context. And this is just like an environment um, in an interpreter or something like that. It maps variables to, instead of values like you would have in an interpreter, it maps variables to types. So you might have a variable x that in the type environment is bound to the type int or the type bool arrow int or something like that. And this rule here is, is almost looks like it's repeating the same thing. It's saying, well, x has type, the variable x has type t if x has type t in gamma. Yeah, so we're saying if you treat the type environment as a set of bindings, we're just, this is just a map, right? And in fact, that's how we're going to implement it as a map in closure, saying that x is bound to t in gamma. Right? Well, then we're just doing a lookup. This is just saying a lookup for the variable case. If you want to know what the type of x is, look it up in the map. That's all it is. This is just how logicians write this, right? I mean, yeah. and, and they couldn't just say, look it up in the map. And here we're putting something in the map. You would never get tenure doing that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's true. <laughs> So here you put something in the map. So we're putting, we're saying x has type t1. But what's strange is that t1 is coming from, it's, it's kind of related, related here and here, but we're not really, we don't see it in this lambda. So we're making up any t1 such that this will hold. Yeah, so this is kind of weird, right? We're deferring our decision of what the type of t1 is until later. Normally what happens is there'll be an application that matches this lambda. And from that application, you'll be able to tell from the argument E2 what the type is flowing in, and that'll tell you the rest of the types. You don't always have that, but so we'll be able to use logic variables to represent 
this delayed decision. So if you think of this as a function where this is, which takes gamma and this term, it looks kind of strange because you have to conjure up this T1. So that's why if, if you look at it as a relation, then you don't really think what is input, what is output. You're just constraining things so that this uh, rule holds. Yeah. And then the only other symbol we haven't talked about is this, this turnstile thing. And uh, that's basically saying that we can infer uh, some value. And then the colon is just this convention to say the thing after this is the type. So that's it. Those are all the symbols. It's very, the comma. So, so this is oh, oh yeah. 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 This okay. Is adding, adding yeah, this, this is gamma. this is extension. We're extending a map with a binding between X and, and T1. Okay. ABS? Abstraction. Yeah, so so okay, good question. We normally we give names to all the rules, which is handy when referring to them. So it, ABS is abstraction, which is lambda. Var is variable, and then app is application, or you can think of procedure application. And in this case, there is one rule per uh, syntax shape. Yeah. In our syntax, we had, um, we had three cases, so here we have three cases as well. Yeah. It's usually, it, it can be more complicated, of course. But. So shall we try to do this in, um, yeah? <laughs> Enclosure? <laughs> okay. So first, we need to do this environment thing. And I guess we're going to use core logic, so we have to define. Oh, OK. Let's just jump to core logic. Well, the reason why we're, we use core logic is because it's kind of complicated to conjure up this. Yeah. This, Th this is actually the sort of problem core logic's really good at. So we'll, we'll do that. So yeah. So env lookup all. We've seen this one before. No. Yeah, so, so here we're just going to represent the uh, typing environment gamma as basically like an association list, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so our environment lookup is, th is a three-place relationship. We want to look up x in the typing environment in for gamma and get back type. But since we're implementing this as a relation instead of a function, you can't really say that we're looking up x and env to get type. You know, we could go backwards. We could say, here's the type. Give me an environment where X has that type, that sort of thing. So um, there's no notion of input and output once we're in a relational world. And, and you can see that's reflected in these rules. There's no notion of input and output. There's above the line and below the line, but you can read them either way, top down or, or bottom up. So yeah, th so this one is, um, So this one is a bit, this, uh, this console thing is really, the, the I, can you explain it? Conzo? So I can keep typing. Oh, OK. <laughs> I never use Conzo, but anyway, Conzo is like cons. <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to, uh, wait, what, what is that? I don't know. What are these black things in closure? Is oh. that like a list or something? This. <laughs> I guess, oh, oh, OK. So we're binding x, the type of x, t of x, uh, in the environment inver to get a new extended environment in, right? Yeah. So it's like the relational version of cons, right? Uh, y and ty, yeah, we're yeah, going to need thanks. to put those in yeah. fresh. And then in the second clause here, the reason Nada wrote this disequality constraint, this not equal thing, is because um, in a con D, it's, it's a mathematical disjunction or logical disjunction. What it means is you try both of the clauses all the time. So it's not like a standard con or, or an if, where if the first succeeds, you don't go to the second clause. You always try both clauses. So the reason we have this disequality constraint is to say, if x isn't the first thing in the association list, uh, then, then we're going to recur. OK. All right. So we can look something up. OK. And the reason we, we had this disequality is if I have this, I really only want the first answer, because the second x is shadowed in the environment. You cannot access it anymore. Yeah, so that's what gives us like proper lexical scope. OK, so we can finally constraint. get to the typing rules now that we have this. So, uh, 
env et, again a condé, one for each case. So if we have, I'm going to use this symbol to, to constrain e to be um, a symbol. And if that's the case, I can just look it up in the environment. And whatever the environment returns is the result. Yeah, and so then, this would be equivalent to just looking it up in a map. And then for the, the uh, other case, I can do this. So for the other case, now I have to match on this uh, X EB, I'll call it. So I, I decide I'm, I'm going to use exactly closure syntax for the, for the, the, the abstraction. Um, so let's see. So this is EB. So EB is the body expression. Mm -hmm. and so this is like lambda x e. So then we do a console. Um, well, L cons is, is, is kind of the, the, the dual of, it, it just puts it right there. So we'll okay. do x. Is that, is that like a closure thing? Yeah, let me think. So what do we need to do? OK, first we have this, this lambda abstraction. And then if we look at the rule, this is, um, if we look at the rule, we first have to evaluate so let's just write what the rule says. It says. It says for, well, for, for one thing, we're going to get an arrow type, right? So we're going to get the type T, T1, arrow T2. OK, so we can put this already. So we say the result is going to be an arrow. And yeah. Um, T1, T2. And then we can say, OK, in the environment, we say that x has type T1. Yeah, so, so here we're extending the environment, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're extending our, our original gamma with a binding between X and T1. And in that extended type environment, we're going to try to infer that the expression E, the body of the lambda, has type T2. So does this match the rule? It looks like it does, right? I mean, yeah, EV. OK, so we have this. And now the last case is if you have an application, E1, E2. Can you, is it possible? Yeah, thank you. OK. Then, so in the application yeah. case, we're going to have to make sure that we recur on both E1 and E2 in terms of our inference. And notice we're, not, we're doing it in the original gamma, the original type environment. We don't have to extend that map at all. And for, furthermore, E1 had better be an arrow type, because otherwise it's not a function, so we can't apply it. If it's an arrow type, for the type of the argument coming into the function had better match the type of the formal parameter to the function. Uh, I think you, oh yeah, okay, so you're doing infix arrow, okay. Yeah. OK, good, yeah. OK, that works. So now let's run it on um, on the empty environment. Let's try uh, to get the type of this. OK, let's type the envir identity environment is Read this as anything goes to that thing. Okay, this is like a basically a for all type. <clears throat> yeah, so so this is just constraining that the input has to be the same as the output type, which is because we have the identity function that makes sense. So now we can just run a, a few a few more examples. Like let, let's just make it let's just run it by itself. So
Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so it's inferring things and, and doing the, the type inference. Okay, so okay. Wait, wait, what did you do? <laughs> I'm just asking for... Oh, you're, you're asking for any two types. Why don't you give it a type? Okay. Okay, so this is really cool. We promised we weren't going to talk about it, but we're going to say something about it. So uh, what we're about to do, I think Dan pointed this out in, um, in a previous talk uh, we gave once, is... Um, we're going to give a type to the inferencer and say, give us a program that has that type. So this is, this is called type inhabitation, or type habitation. And here, uh, I guess we're getting 10 different programs in the Lambda Calculus that have that particular type of A, a goes to A. And uh, the, this is important because this is the latest thing called the Curry-Howard isomorphism, where you can uh, basically look at uh, the programs that you're generating as proofs in uh, logic. So uh, okay. this is the basis of a uh, number of theorem provers and things like that. Okay, let's go back to inference rules. So Actually, can you go back one mm -hmm. more step? So, so the point of this is not to show that we can, we can do the inference for simply uh, type lambda calculus, because that's not terribly difficult, but, but the point is to show that, once again, when you see the horizontal bar, that should mean something to you, okay? It should mean that basically we're talking about relations. And furthermore, if you look at any paper that has typing rules, they will look probably very similar to this, but maybe with some extensions, like we'll see uh, later on, okay? So, so if you kind of keep these rules in mind, you'll see that most papers are kind of extending these or, or modifying them a little bit. and then you have at least a starting point and a chance to understand what's going on with, the, with their new system. So uh, another, another type of relation that, that occurs often is reduction. Here we're, we're starting with the term and we're just taking a step and computing a little bit of it. And so the rule to compute is saying if you have a lambda and a value here, then you, you do this, this substitution step where you say in E you replace the variable x with the value v. And this is the only computation step that goes on in, in, the, in the lambda calculus. The other steps are really just so that you know how you can, you can take a step when you have a, an expression that is more complex than that. Yeah, so, so this beta rule, this expression here where you have a lambda expression dr uh, directly applied to, to a value, that's, that's called a redex. And these rules down here are to try to figure out where in a compound expression, we might find the redex so we can reduce it. And that's called congruence rules. Yeah. And now we just want to show that, so this is a, a kind of rewriting, a rewriting style of, 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 uh, of rules where you go from one, one term to another, but here the target type is the same. And yeah. we just wanted to show a, another example where the target is different. Oh, actually, can we go back to that one? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so, so we're not going to implement these rules um, in this case, but once again, you have your warm fuzzy with the horizontal line. <laughs> what shouldn't be so fuzzy in your heart is that beta step of that substitution. Turns out that's actually really tricky to get right, and there are special rules for that. Uh, there's a mathematical convention often given um, to try to avoid having to specify all the rules for the substitute the capture avoiding substitution where it'll basically say, oh yeah, we assume you, your variables are named such that this, you, know, you don't really have to worry about it, right? But it's kind of on you to make sure that happens. Um, so that's actually the tricky part. But the, the inference rules themselves are, are very straightforward. Okay. So the idea here is that we, we're going to, to change you don't even need to understand CPS here. We're just going to show you the rule, and it will kind of make sense. It's probably better if you don't understand CPS. Yeah, so let's just, <laughs> let's just go ahead. Well, the, the, we have these atomic expressions, which are e either variable or simple abstractions. Oh, this should be a C, but... And complex expressions, which are this application. And then these are the rules. And it, it's, it's kind of like a, a rewriting system. And, um, and the only... So it's, it's, it's... What is uh, that? What is that E, uh, yeah, YK so, thing? Okay. So you have, so this, uh, this T relation takes two inputs. It takes X and a syntactic continuation. And so if you have a variable, it just calls the syntactic continuation on the variable which has been passed through this M rewrite rule. So there's two, there are two relations here that are mutually inductive. There's M, like this M relation and this T relation. 
Okay, and you're gonna live code this? Well, we only have six minutes. So oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Not a not a promise who's gonna like live code this cold. Yeah, but I yeah I think I think it's so, <laughs> okay. So, fine. So, okay, so we, let, let's literally just explain how you would do it. You just use match, <laughs> and here there is like one case for each each of the syntactic structure. So this is left as an exercise to do. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, another thing we want to show is, is this evaluation, which is really just a different way of specific, we, 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 saw, we saw reduction, which was a way of, of showing the computation at every step. And so this is called small step operational semantics, and another thing is this big step operational semantics, which uses an environment <coughs> that's like the typing environment, but here it's a runtime environment, which matches variables and values. And in this context, because we want to have lexical scope, our values are actually closures. Yeah, so this row thing is the normal environment that maps variables to values instead of the gamma that maps variables to types. And the down arrow is basically our evaluation relation. Um, and, and otherwise, you can see we have an environment extension like we had before. And then we have the recursive calls, except we just have these data structures closures we could, rec we could represent as lists or sequences and, or whatever. And uh, the application rule is actually quite subtle because here we're using the environment from the closure definition when we're doing the, evaluating the body. And that's, that's what gives you lexical scoping as opposed to dynamic scoping. So just by changing this row here from row one to row, you would get dynamic scoping. But we, uh, these rules, unlike the, uh, the reduction rules that require the beta step with the um, uh, capture avoiding substitution, these rules you really can just type in to core logic and it works just fine. And in fact, if you add list and quote rules, then you get an interpreter runs backwards and can generate quines. Uh, okay, so ICFP. So okay, this so is now the we're paper. gonna switch gears to the Ooh. paper? Yeah. So okay, so now we're actually gonna show you like a real paper. So actually in the paper, the rules we just showed you about this operational semantics appears here. And it's more complicated, but the, the basic rule looks the same. So for the, this is the, the beta rule. And again, you see this down arrow and we're using, they're using a slightly different syntax for how they extend the environment. But this is the rule we just saw. Yeah, so this is once again extending the map, basically. But just to take a step back, this paper has a lot of rules. And usually that's not how you would read it. You would not start by looking at the rules. So you, the title is Logical Types for Untyped Languages, and that's the, the paper at the foundation of core typed. Now, if you're Dan, you actually start by looking at the rules. And if you're Oleg, you start by looking at the LaTeX. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but it takes a while to get that point. I mean, after some point, you can actually look at just the, the rules in the boxes, and you're like, hey, why they put that hat there, right? But, yeah. Um, but, but that's, would, we, we don't recommend starting out that way. I would start by looking at the examples of what, what this is trying to achieve. So the idea here is that you have um, a function where the, the parameter type is either a string or a number, and this type checks because you can add one to x when you're in the, in the branch where um, the, the number predicate, uh, the number, this, this number function returned true, so in this branch, you know that x is actually a number. And furthermore, you know that in the s branch, it is definitely not a number, but you know more, you know that it's a string. So you can use string length, which is, yeah, like counting the, the length of the string. And so if you look at how they achieve this, they use a typing judgment that is extended, but the basic part of the judgment looks exactly like what we showed you for typing. You have a gamma, you have an expression E, and the result is this tau. They just use a Greek letter while we use this capital T, but yeah, it's the only That's difference. the type. But the key insight is that by looking at, at here, you can see, okay, what is this extra stuff they're doing? And it turns out that what they do, and uh, the text explains it rather clearly, is that they, they actually extend this so that they when, when, when this evaluates to a, to a true like value, they, um, this proposition here will hold, 
And when it evaluates to a false value, this proposition here will hold the negative one. So they have a way to track for, for each expression which propositions hold if this expression is, is, is a true like value or a false like value. And I asked Nada, what is this O thing? And her response was? Well, we don't need to, to, to understand everything at, uh, <laughs> at, like, at the same time. Like, it's, already, it's already kind of, you, 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 you pat yourself on the back when you understand one thing, and then you, you take a coffee, and then you understand uh, another thing. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> but, I thought that was good advice. <laughs> yeah. OK, so we're running short on, on time. So I think what one, we want to end by giving some strategies on how you actually end up reading these papers. Personally, I always go to the examples first, and then I look at the syntax of what it is the, that, this, what, that they're modeling exactly. So here you see that in their type system, they actually have unions, and they have these lambdas that are extended with these like propositions, so you can actually know when you, when you have a function uh, what kind of propositions you can infer once this function is, uh, is evaluated. So, so I, I look at the, the syntax, I look at the examples and the motivation. What about you? Uh, well, first thing is, um, I guess, going a step back, whenever I'm trying to learn about some new area of computer science, the first thing I try to do is look and find good papers to start with, right? Because you don't necessarily want to start with the most dense technical paper in the world. And there are two really good sources of information. So one are survey papers. So for example, um, Jacques Cohen had a great survey paper on constraint logic programming, or introduction to constraint logic programming that's very, very readable. And you know, it looks, look for something like that, an intro paper or, or a, a survey paper. The other thing that's really good to read are actually dissertations. If you can find papers by a graduate student and you don't understand them at all, hopefully they graduated by a time you read that paper and you can read their dissertation because their dissertation, unlike the papers that are length constrained, the dissertations are usually much more self-contained and also um, much gentler. Because, like Richard Feynman had a saying that you should write your dissertation for yourself when you're just starting in your studies where you are smart but ignorant, right? So if you, a good dissertation is written that way. So dissertations are actually much easier to read normally than a short paper. So so that's another good thing to look. When I actually find a paper I like, what I do is I look at the intro, I look at the abstract, and then I immediately look at the bibliography to see what the references are. And I do this with all the papers I read in a certain area. And often what I'll find is, after I read a few papers, I'll see the same papers coming up over and over again in the bibliographies. That's usually a hint that those are important papers that I can do, like a paper trail uh, later. And then afterwards, uh, kind of like Nada, I, I, I go for the examples, and then from that, start looking at the rules. OK, so this concludes our talk. Thank you very much.